same. Zuko of Zcash, Arthur Brightman of Tezos, Brian Warner now of Agoric, Jorge of Gravity. This was, you know, four or five chains at the time represented in this conversation in 2017. I just had to put that up there as sort of a start of this thing. Now, what actually will probably turn into the interchain, you know, it, you know, started from some of the work that began, oh yes, uh, in a paper, now this is one of the papers that captures several of the key insights that are leading to the interchain, which is connected blockchains. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that by Markham and a few other, uh, 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 Bill Tulla, our economist, and Tom Van Kunsen, uh, um, from who's in Australia. And that was, you know, before Ethereum, that was before a lot of blockchain, that was a vision of software services running on independent servers, communicating over secure protocols in order to engage in commerce um, uh, and engage in other cooperation, where the cooperation among strangers was orchestrated by programs that anyone could write in JavaScript. Now, at the time, JavaScript could not actually be safe enough to do that, I think, Maybe, you know, but that was part of the reason why I'm running my software on my computer and you're running your software on your computer. But this laid down the groundwork for what it would take to be able to have JavaScript, what features you needed in JavaScript to be able to do it where you could run JavaScript from different parties in the same place interacting and not have them interfere with each other. Now, I'm not mostly gonna talk about that, but I'm happy to spend time on, on that later. Um, it also in inspired the loosely coupled, you know, the, this model of independent services all communicating securely um, and inspired that work out of the Cosmos ecosystem where what's called the Inner Blockchain Communication Protocol has been, has been started, right? So um, from our perspective at the time, it was machines all communicating, each acting on behalf of the owner of those machines. But we knew you could do more than that, we, right? Even then, we could see that handheld devices were coming. We had laptops. There were servers and data systems. Blockchain came along and was sort of a surprise out of left field. I articulate that as, you know, it's, it's, it's really new computers made out of agreement rather than silicon, right? You know, a, a gold standard of blockchain is multiple machines in multiple jurisdictions administered by different organizations so that no one human organization or government can corrupt the execution. And then all of those machines come to consensus about the data. Dean has 100 bucks in his account. And the order of events, Dean made a bid and then withdrew it, and somewhere along the way the auction closed. Did Dean win the auction? Or did he get his money back? You can't have it both ways. And so you need having a hundred machines come to consensus about that, or a thousand machines or whatever it is, is just this leap forward in integrity of execution and enables us to run smart contracts in a context where there's no trusted intermediary. There's no eBay in the middle that's operating the software and could stick their fingers in. There's no, you know, there's no uh, uh, ride sharing management or Enron that can slip in an, an electricity trade. So blockchains added a level of integrity that we haven't seen before, but it can operate in this fabric of communicating machines where a blockchain is just a kind of machine. Okay, so what is the interchain, right? It's, you know, this is where, what got the term interchain started because, and this is a whole bunch of networks. I think there's 50 chains and growing, 50 blockchains and growing, all of which interface to other machines um, that might, you know, in the, like the case of Akash, control cloud services and what have you. But these are the independent blockchains, right? And so I'm going to focus on the, the blockchain interoperability, but the vision is broader than that. Um, you know, there's, this used to be $80 billion, now it's $10 billion. That's what happens, it's a volatile market, and it's going up, right? Um, <laughs> that's what happens, right? Um, but, but these are all connected with the inter-blockchain communication protocol. Um, I'll, say, I'll say a fair bit more about that. That was started in the Cosmos ecosystem, but, and it was inspired by, you know, very directly by the, the Elang site and the earlier work we did on large-scale distributed, secure distributed commerce. Um, and it is now extending to other, other ecosystems. So there are folks working on bridging it to Near, bridging it to Polkadot, bridging it even to Ethereum. And so this is, this is the thing where the internet started with you know, a whole bunch of different networks, Genie, CompuServe, and this tiny, you know, this ARPANET that you couldn't do anything commercial on, and this tiny little bit of non-commercial things, and it just kind of, that, that element of how to do ARPANET and a little bit of commercial ARPANET just grew to consume everything. This is kind of in the same place, and I'll say a little bit about why. So a lot of what I'm doing is covering kind of where this goes. 
th this whole interchain does currently connect to, eco to other ecosystems via bridges. Let me talk about the difference, right? I've got two networks and they're, they want to talk to each other. The bridge model is someone steps up in the middle, this network, this blockchain says, I have generated the following transaction in a way that anyone can authenticate according to this blockchain that everyone came to consensus that Dean in fact won the auction. This bridge in the middle is trusted by some people to go, oh, Dean won the auction, let me tell this other chain. And the other chain is then believing the bridge in the middle, right? It's believing the three machines operated by some consortium running potentially proprietary code that this other chain over here just made a multi-billion dollar decision for my hundred dollar auction, right? Um, and that's okay. There's an astonishing amount of monetary value that is being transited between you know, Solana and Ethereum via these bridges or Aave and Ethereum or whatever it is. But those bridges are fundamentally fragile, right? When people have, you know, you'll see these exploits of, oh, wormhole bridge, $340 million because of a bug. You know, poly network bridge, $660 million because of a bug. By the way, both are Androidsy bugs that you shouldn't have, but we'll come back to that. Um, and so bridges are a thing. They're so important that $340 million jumps at, eh, suck. All right, here, here's the check. Let me repopulate it. Let's keep going. Because we need the bridge. The connectivity and the ability to interoperate is just so important important that companies will slap down that kind of money in order to keep everything working. But the, the IBC is different, right? And it's actually substantially more reliable, which is why it's worth sort of feeding into your consciousness of how could this world of blockchains grow and how close am I? Um, so it's like TCP for blockchains, right? That's the goal, where you've got two layers. You've got, I can connect to that guy and send data, and then I've got an application layer, right? So it is blockchain neutral. Yes, it started in the Cosmos ecosystem, but was designed for adoption by other, by other folks, because the goal of the ent that entire system really was the interchain, not a particular tech stack. It is all open source. It is permissionless, so I can connect my blockchain to your blockchain without having to get anyone's agreement. Um, in fact, someone on my chain could potentially put, connect to someone on your chain without anyone else on the chain's agreement and so forth. That's very important, and that's one of the elements that helped the internet grow. And then finally, it's extensible, right? And, and we'll talk about the extensible in a moment of the thing that TCP gives you is this layer of communication, what someone called the, the, the DAO of connectivity, right? Transport, authentication, and ordering, TAO. Right? So, and what, what IBC did is it wasn't really a new invention. It was taking the best practices as a bunch of experts were doing on a bunch of chains to do one-off bridges and that sort of thing and building it into this protocol so it really could be the sustainable TCP level reusable kind of connectivity. And then above that we have app protocols, right? So token transfer, just the ability to transfer from my account to your account on another chain in the Cosmos ecosystem, that's now so trivial and pervasive that people kind of don't think about it as being different chains. I bring out my wallet, I send money to that account over there, it's on Osmosis, great. You've now got it over there and you can put it into Osmosis smart contract, right? It's on Agora, great. You can dump it into a JavaScript smart contract, all works. Right? Um, interchain accounts, that's where a program on one chain can act as a client on another chain. So it can open an account and do trade. So we can have in JavaScript written on Agoric, a portfolio manager that's managing accounts on several different chains, all transparently, all connected, all robustly connected to each other. Um, you know, NFT transfers, there's a bunch of other use cases and growing all the time. The key thing about TCP, there's no centralization and authority you have to go talk to to add a new application protocol. It's just you start your application talking on one chain, talking to your application on another, some new protocol, and now other people can join it. Or you can get other people on board in order to standardize how we might do this interoperably a bunch of, across a bunch of applications, and that's happening. Okay. So let me add one more thing on this. So the, the difference in IBC is it's not chain A sends a message to chain B and some bridge in the middle is trusted to, cor to correctly and honestly represent what happened and also not be, uh, not be buggy such that it can be attacked by attackers. In IBC, there's, you know, chains, all they can do is write data to a store. So they'll write down, deliver the message to Dean that he won the auction. A relayer in the middle will pick that up but it'll pick it up along with the proofs that chain A issued that transaction. And it'll then deliver that to the chain that Dean lives on, which will then not care 
about the relayer. The relayer delivered the packet, but it's just the postman delivering the letter. You know, that chain's gonna rip open the envelope and look at the actual contents and verify the signature. And so it's directly verifying that chain A actually agreed and issued this transaction. So now what I've got is a reliable connection, a, a, a high integrity connection between A and B, where all I need is some relayer anywhere, and it doesn't matter who, and it can be provided by multiple people, to pick up this nice, you know, this nice signed package and drop it over the chain. And so it's a protocol that has all of the acts and windowing, all the stuff you'd expect of TCP, only with this kind of high integrity communication that can be robust in a very growing and decentralized fashion. So the inner chain already exists, it's coming, all your blockchains will belong to it. Um, and that's a good thing because it'll be permissionless, so all your blockchains will belong to you as well. So. <laughs> What incentivizes people to act as those gateways, and how do you prevent that incentive from like just centralizing it up, single it up, which is So the things in the middle are relayers, as they're called. Is that what you mean? So there are two things that, that incentivize them. Often, someone at either end will have an incentive to do it. I'm trying to pay you, so you can run a relayer just for the packets about us, and my packets will be delivered, and you'll get paid. Um, in our case, Agoric is setting up relationships with some chains that are going to be providing assets. We'll pay for a third party to operate the relayer, but if they go away, we can spin up a machine to cover it for a couple of days while we find someone else. Because they aren't trusted, it becomes easy to set up a wide variety of incentive schemes for them. And there's infrastructure in the IBC protocol itself so that the participants in a message can say, add a tip to the delivery person so, so they'll deliver it on time. Deliver it quickly or what happened? Yeah, most of it is indirect. So, some like a validator validating a Goric and a Kosh has an incentive for a cross chain communication, so they run the layers That's right. as well. Yeah. yeah, Figment's floating around here and probably knows that. Another question? Yeah, some of your idea. Yeah, there, Figment. <laughs>